asked some students here at Huntington University a few years ago. It was in a Understanding the Christian Faith class, and we were doing a session on spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. And I asked what I thought would be a good discussion question. I said, what are the traits of a spiritually mature person? What does spiritually ma spiritual maturity look like? Somewhat to my surprise, the students did not want to answer that question. Instead, they said things like, nobody's perfect. We never arrive in this life. We can't be holy in this life. And spiritual maturity is just between you and God. Looking for signs of maturity is judgmental. This is not an isolated example. Uh, let me give you a few quotes that I've run across in the past couple of years. I guess I'll have to start thinking of myself as an adult now, said one 40-something male to me. <laughs> one 22-year-old uh, young lady said, children will be, quote, what makes your life like full after like you're done with your life, I guess. <laughs> and my personal favorite, this was uh, written on a blog site, someone uh, commenting on someone who had blogged about my book. Uh, this is about me. I, I am another moralist Christian telling other Christians to live up to his standards. Sorry, bro, you blow. I have no standards, only Jesus. Get a life. <laughs> so my question tonight is, <laughs> Whatever happened to spiritual maturity, and what can be done to recover it? Well, to put it, to put it simply, juvenilization happened to spiritual maturity. Juvenilization is the process by which the religious beliefs, practices, and developmental characteristics of adolescents become accepted as appropriate for Christians of all ages. And this process, I argue in my book, has in fact happened over the last 50 to 75 years in American churches. It doesn't look the same in every church. Uh, there are people who have resisted this trend in various ways, but this is a reality that's been out there that has faced every church in one way or another. There are uh, three main sources or causes of juvenilization. First is youth cultures. Around uh, 1940, there was an emergence of new and more strong and more national youth cultures in America. The second dynamic, uh, intergenerational faith dynamics, and I'll talk about each of these a little bit. Uh, and then finally, changes in adulthood. And these three things working together create what I call the dilemma of juvenilization. That is, churches could adapt to youth culture at the risk of creating an immature faith, or they could ignore youth culture and potentially forfeit the interest and the commitment of the young. And what I really mean, this is a dilemma. And like other dilemmas, it's not one that can be easily resolved. And anyone who tells you it can be is dreaming. This is a real challenge, a real dilemma. First, youth culture. As I said, around 1940, uh, the term teenager itself was coined, and that was because something new was happening amongst younger people in America. And uh, very early on in this process, there were signs of what was to come. One young lady quoted in a newsreel called Teenage Girls uh, that appeared in theaters in 1944 said this, we just want to live our own lives. We're not in a hurry to grow up and get all serious and morbid like older people. And this dynamic of not wanting to grow up, although not new to human history, uh, think of Peter Pan around the turn of the 20th century, uh, took on a new force and a new urgency and a new popularity to the point where you can now have quotes from people in their 40s saying, I guess I have to think of myself as an adult now. Secondly, intergenerational dynamics. The first one is fear. Fear. And this was a significant in the founding era of youth ministry that I've studied in the, in the book. There's been a couple founding eras. I studied the second founding era, basically. And uh, 
fear of young people and what might happen to them was very present in the 1930s and 1940s. You see here a picture of the Hitler Youth. And uh, there was very real fear that American young people were going to either become communists or fascists or fall into some other horrible fate. And this is not unique to that era. You may have noticed, if you've lived at all in American culture, that periodically there are panics about young people and what's happening with them. The problem with adults relating to young people out of fear is that it turns young people into one of two things. Either they're scapegoats that is to blame for everything that's wrong with society and the world, or they're helpless victims who aren't responsible at all for themselves. The second intergenerational dynamic is hope, although I was searching for a word that wasn't so positively Christian in the word hope, maybe misplaced hope or something. In other words, putting hope in something that hope that shouldn't be the source of our hope. As Christians, our hope should be in God, not in whatever the next generation is supposedly doing or not doing. This photo shows John Lewis and other participants in the civil rights movement uh, kneeling to pray in the midst of their civil rights activities. And not just for African American Christians, but for a broad spectrum of Christians at the time and since. When we see young people doing something that we think is good, that we would like to see happen to change society, there's a tendency to overproject that all young people are doing this and therefore everything is going to be fine. Uh, but the problem with this is it makes young people into our saviors. And I think we should all know as Christians that other human beings are not our savior. Jesus Christ is our savior. What's common to both of these, uh, whether it's the fear response or the hope response of intergenerational dynamics, is that young people become not fully human. They're either scapegoats or victims or saviors, but they're not human beings. Adults are not fully responsible. Hey, if we can blame everything on young people and what's happening with them, and I don't have to be, take as much responsibility for myself. Or they're too responsible. They're all victims of, of something that we're doing as adults. Most of all, there's a lot of shallow thinking about youth and adults and inter intergenerational ministry, and that leads to bad decisions about youth work and youth ministry. But the most important intergenerational dynamic that happened over the past 75 years is, uh, in the church is Christian youth ministries. And in this founding era of the 1930s and 40s, many, many, many new uh, youth ministries were founded across the spectrum of Christian denominations. And I talk about four different streams in the book, African American, mainline Protestant, evangelical, and African American churches and their youth ministries. But tonight I just want to focus on the model that essentially came to dominate, and this model came out of the evangelical stream. And it was to create a kind of a Christian youth culture. So you had things like Christian films uh, portraying teenage life uh, and uh, having an evangelistic message at the end. Uh, you had basically the typical club model of youth work, a lot of fun and games, a simplified or even simplistic uh, Bible message, a, a place to belong. And at its best, these types of youth club-based youth ministries attract teens to consider uh, faith who might otherwise not consider it and keep them interested and keep them coming to a Christian activity until they can have a life-changing encounter with God. And that happened for literally millions of young people over the past 75 years. And so much, much good was done by these groups. But at their worst, sometimes these club-based youth ministries could degenerate into making the church or Christian faith into a youth-friendly product to be consumed. And it could create some dubious uh, spiritualities like this one, Jesus is my boyfriend. Or, to take another example, quoting a young person from the 1950s. As you may know, you know from, your, from the history books, there was a guy named Elvis Presley who was very popular in the 1950s. And uh, Christians, evangelical Christians, knew that they should have nothing to do with this man and his gyrating hips. Uh, and so, uh, there was an article in... Uh, Youth for Christ magazine, in which uh, a young lady, a member of Youth for Christ, 
gave her understanding of, of how to think about this Elvis thing, how attractive he was to many fans. She said this, the fact of the matter is, I found something else that has given me more of a thrill than a hundred Presley's ever could. It's a new friendship with the most wonderful person I've ever met, a man who has given me happiness and thrills and something worth living for. Now this sounds good at first until you start to think about it a little bit more. In other words, what she's kind of saying is, Jesus is just like Elvis, only better. So Jesus is a kind of a teen idol rock star. Now, I know this young lady meant well, and so have the many people throughout the years who have said, well, let's just scoop out the worldly quote-unquote content and pour in some Jesus content and we're good to go. Well-meaning people who love the Lord, who love young people. There's just one problem with this. Maybe Jesus isn't really a lot much like Elvis at all. So what happened because of juvenilization is that youth ministries became what you might call church time machines. If you wanted to see what church would look like in 20 years or 10 years or whatever it was, just go visit the youth ministry. And so we have to ask ourselves this question. I'll be asking some reflection questions as we go here. This is the first of them. Would we be comfortable if 20 years from now the whole church's life looked exactly like our youth ministry does today? Now, of course, youth culture and intergenerational dynamics and youth ministries did not create juvenilization by themselves. It wasn't youth group that caused that 40-year-old guy to say, I guess I have to think of myself as an adult now. He got that from some other sources, too. And that brings on our next source of juvenilization, the new adulthood. Adulthood has changed. I can go more into this in the questions and answers if you're interested. But the old adulthood was de defined by early and clustered transitions. Most people finished school, got married, started a job, started having kids earlier in life and clustered quickly together in their late teens and early 20s at least in the mid-20th century America. Now those things are all separated out. And also, the old adult who was kind of, in a sense, forced on you relatively early in life by those transitions. Some people did not rise well to the occasion, that's for sure. But you really didn't have much choice. You had to either sink or swim. Today, it's a much longer, more self-defined, more ongoing process. The old adult who was focused on responsibility for others by getting married and raising children. The new adulthood is focused on responsibility for self. When are you an adult? When you can take responsibility for yourself. The journey is so much longer that psychologists have identified a new stage of life. That doesn't come along all the time. There's a brand new stage of life now called emerging adulthood. And again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but as you can see by the one of these uh, uh, book titles, Lost in Transition, it's a difficult time. It's a lengthy, difficult transition. If we think of adolescence or youth as a relatively brief time that people quickly grow out of, our thinking is not in step with reality. Today, between the onset of puberty and someone settling down and getting married and starting having children can be as much as 20 years. That is a long time. If you live 80 years, that's one quarter of your life. So youth is different than it was. As a result of changes in, in society, changes in adulthood, changes in the life course, these things have affected Christianity, as well as new ways of doing Christianity that were more youth-friendly that happened in youth ministries and elsewhere. It created a new, uh, immature, almost Christian, with traits like this. Moralistic therapeutic deism, a uh, national study of youth and religion, found that this is the default religion of American teenagers. They believe God wants me. There's a God that's somewhere there in the background. He wants me to be good. And the main purpose of all that God stuff is to help me feel good. Uh, lots of research in America suggests that people are, are think it's great to be spiritual, to have a relationship with God, to believe in God. But church, eh, you know. I mean, I know a lot of people here in, in the town of Huntington who say, sure, I definitely believe in God, but I don't think you need to go to church. That's all I can't man. And then finally, uh, both in my own personal experience and I've looked at some uh, national research on this, there seems to be some confusion amongst Christians about spiritual maturity. What is it? Do we really want to go there? 
Um, one survey found that both church members and pastors were kind of confused about what spirit, spiritual maturity might mean. Although they're pretty sure that they and their church are fine, but somewhere out there it's a big problem. So I want to talk now about what congregations can do. Uh, the first step I want to highlight is to think about recentering spiritual maturity in what we do. What I mean by this is we, we need to talk about spiritual maturity in our churches. We need to hold it up as a positive ideal. I hope that it was an anomaly, an unusual case that my students in my class, when I asked them what spiritual maturity looks like, didn't like thinking about that. I hope that was, I hope that was an exception. Uh, but as I talked to a lot of people about the book over the past couple of years, a lot of them say things like, oh yeah, spiritual maturity, yeah, that's a good thing, I think, and we should do something about that. Uh, but they're not, it's not on the tip of their tongues. The first thing I want to say about uh, recentering spiritual maturity is that we need to think about how to connect spiritual maturity and spiritual growth to the gospel. Um, Dallas Willard, uh, I heard him say once, that if the gospel we preach does not include the ideas of spiritual transformation, we shouldn't fault people for not growing and changing after they get saved, because they didn't sign up for that. Uh, the gospel that you hear in a lot of our churches, well, it's part of the gospel, can be misleading, in, in, in especially in American culture. The gospel that says you'll go to heaven when you die if you believe that Jesus took your punishment, or the simplified version, Jesus died for your sins, it's true enough. But it gets misunderstood in our contemporary American culture. The corollary is what Dallas Willard calls the gospel of sin management. Uh, you know, Jesus just died to keep forgiving me of my sins. The way I like to say it is, some of our versions of understanding the gospel and living the gospel essentially say, you can expect to be just as rotten a sinner on the day you die as the day you got saved. And I don't think that's a biblical understanding of the gospel, but I think that's a default understanding of a lot of American Christians. Because after all, there's no difference between Christians and non-Christians except that Christians are forgiven. Not technically true, theologically, but a very popular slogan in American culture. Christians are different. Christians are a new creation. Christians have died and been raised with Christ, says Romans 6. So, I know that this is touchy ground. Anytime you start talking about the gospel and people start being worried about are you adding something to the gospel or are you falling into works righteousness, I can say more about that in the questions and answers if you're interested. But I'm not being prescriptive about how you relate spiritual growth to the gospel. I'm just saying you should think about how you're going to do that. Should some, some people in your church should understand that responding to the gospel means signing up for a lifelong transformation in Christ. Uh, the second thing that I want to say about uh, recentering spiritual maturity is that uh, we need to help people with their expectations about what they can expect when it comes to spiritual maturity. The first expectation is that spiritual maturity is desirable. Philippians 3, Paul talks about uh, leaving behind all all those other things that he used to trust in and running after Christ and being conformed to his death and resurrection and that this thinking that way, avoiding both works righteousness and complacency and striving to grow in Christ and be like Christ and share in his suffering and his death and his resurrection, that was mature thinking. But you get the sense from that passage that Paul is passionately pursuing Christ, that uh, Becoming more and more conformed to the image of Christ is so desirable to him that he's willing to count everything as garbage by comparison. So we can ask ourselves, do we in our church have a positive vision of spiritual maturity that is compelling and attractive? What are we doing to model a vibrant, attractive spiritual adulthood? Let me just say that one reason why nobody wants to grow up, either humanly or physically in American, or spiritually in American culture, might be there aren't too many attractive models of spiritually vibrant adulthood out there. Uh, so we want to make, see what are we doing to make spiritual maturity desirable versus mature being a code word for old and done and stuck. Attainable. This is one that is kind of surprising to me, but I think it relates to some of those theological slogans that people believe. Uh, 
Hebrews 5.11 says, By now you should be able to teach others the basic ideas of Christianity, but you're needing to be taught the basics all over again. In other words, the writer of Hebrews thought, after a reasonable amount of time, the Hebrew Christians he was writing to should have been spiritually mature. But they weren't. There's an assumption in the passage that every Christian, after a reasonable amount of time, should be spiritually mature. Um, so we need to ask ourselves, do the members of our congregation equate spiritual maturity with an unattainable perfection like those students that I had in my class a number of years ago? What can we do to explain and to help them see that it's possible? Um, I'm taking to calling spiritual maturity uh, kind of a basic competency in the Christian life. Uh, because I think somehow this mature, in a culture where mature is a bad word or means you're very, almost dead, I guess, uh, your life's over, you know. Uh, maybe I, I want to rehabilitate the biblical word mature, but maybe we need to talk about basic competency in the Christian life and show how it is possible. The last expectation I want to address is uh, visible. Spiritual maturity that's in someone's life should be visible in contrast to the common view that it's only internal or invisible or subjective. Um, this is partly because American culture says that the subjective internal things are the most important. Uh, but the Bible says you should see fruit on the tree. You know, if you go up to a tree in the season of fruit and you see apples on it, you say, aha, this is an apple tree. Okay. If you go up to a Christian in the season of fruit and you see love, joy, peace, uh, patience, kindness, you say, aha, this is a Christian. I'm seeing some fruit. So the Bible, I think, without becoming judgmental, says we should be able to see the fruit on the tree. And so this is something we need to think about and grapple with, and maybe we can talk about the discussion. How do you encourage people to grow the spiritual fruit without becoming judgmental or without... Uh, putting the wrong kind of pressure on people, or helping making people think that somehow they're only worthy if they are uh, especially fruitful in their character. The third thing I want to say about recentering spirituality is that we need to think about the content of spirituality, of spiritual maturity. So, first of all, uh, we've already seen in Hebrews chapter 5, that knowing the basics of the faith is something that should be included in the idea of spiritual maturity. So, how can you tell if someone's spiritually mature? Can they explain the basic ideas of Christianity to someone else? That's what Hebrews 5 says. Uh, so we can ask the question in our churches, what are the basics that everybody should know? Do our church members know those basics? Can they explain those basics? One of the things that was found in the National Study of Major Religion is when they asked a lot of American teenagers, so tell me what you believe about God, they did not. They struggled. It seemed as if, in some cases, these poor teenagers, it was the first time they'd ever been asked to articulate anything about their faith. Now, I know there are many teenagers that are more articulate about that, but I think one of the reasons why, for example, a lot of adults shy away from getting involved in the youth ministry in our church is because they kind of know that we found out. I can't really say the first thing. I've been going to church for a long time with my kids, and I can't really say the first thing about what it's all about. So they're intimidated. So we need to help people of all ages to know what the basics are and to have practice in explaining them to others. Secondly, uh, Spiritual maturity is communal. Ephesians 4 says that as each part of the body does its work, the body builds itself up in spiritual maturity. Um, we could ask the question, is our congregation as a body spiritually mature, and what could help? Do the people who are members of our church, who attend our church, realize that they can't possibly grow or mature in the Christian life without being connected to the local body of Christ? That goes directly against a lot of American assumptions. Americans believe that we are isolated individuals and anything that we can, uh, the best things that we do, we do by ourselves. Um, but that's not what the Bible says. Missional. Uh, the Great Commission says, go and make disciples. Jesus, in John 20, 21, said, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. 
Does every person who is part of our church realize that to be a follower of Jesus means joining his disciples on mission? Are we doing mission together? Is it an expected part of the Christian life, or is it something just for the few, those who are really into it? And finally, suffering and comfort. I think we need to help believers realize that both suffering and comfort should be expected as a normal part of the Christian life. Versus the default American culture religion that says religion is only valuable insofar as it makes me feel happy. What are we teaching people about their emotions in the Christian life? Do they see that suffering and comfort are both parts of discipleship? Do they even know that Paul in Philippians 3 and 2 Corinthians 4 tells us that he felt the closest to Jesus when he was suffering with Jesus on behalf of the gospel? Do they even know that? I grew up in church and I heard I don't know how many sermons and I went to Sunday school every Sunday and I don't think I ever heard something that was core to Paul's spirituality, that he felt the closest to Christ when he was suffering on behalf of the gospel. And by the way, the time to teach people about suffering is when they're not suffering, so that when the suffering comes, they'll be prepared. The second thing we can do, in addition to recentering spiritual maturity in our churches, is we can think more carefully about culture. American churches have a bad track record in this. One of my personal favorites is the slogan, in the world but not of it, as if that solves everything. It's a nice slogan, but it's, and it's even based in Jesus' words in John chapter 17, but it easily reduces to individual subjective criteria. I feel like I'm not really of the world, even though I'm in it, so I'm good. It's an ideal, maybe a starting point, but it's not the whole toolkit. And in particular, if there's one thing that I've learned from looking at the history of youth ministry, and it's creative and often wonderful attempts to adapt Christian faith to the cultures of rising generations, is that people need to realize that cultural forms are not neutral. It's actually amazing to me the degree to which Americans are delusional about this. Okay, Just look at the iPad commercials. First, the iPad commercial was... This changes everything, but I guess that scared too many people. So the next iPad commercial was, you can do everything you did before, only better. It'll be the same, only better. So whether it's technology or faith or whatever, Americans tend to think that the methods you use, the means of communication you use, the cultural forms you use are kind of neutral communication tools. But kind of communication 101 says that's just not true. Yes, we can communicate using culture. The gospel can be translated into any culture. It's legitimate to have the Bible translated into all of our languages. Yeah, that's one of the wonders of what God has created in creating the gospel in the church. But at the same time, if we think it's all neutral, we will get in trouble. So, to take an example I mentioned earlier, if, you say, if you're going to say that Jesus is just like Elvis, you better be very sure that people can see the differences too. A better way, I think, is to think about our youth ministries and indeed any of our outreach ministries, any point where we're trying to share Christ with others and reach out to the cultures around us, using two metaphors that I have used with regard to youth ministries in particular, but it applies to other outreach ministries. First is digestive system. Youth ministries are the digestive system of the church. Youth ministries ingest cultural stuff, and they send its nutrients and occasionally its poisons into the body of Christ. And this can be true of other outreach uh, ministries as well. Another metaphor that I've used is the metaphor of laboratory. Youth ministries have been laboratories of innovation in the church. If there had been no youth ministries innovating over the past 75 years in American churches, if American churches today look exactly like they did in 1940, they would be even far more empty than they are now. Youth ministries revitalized American Christianity by adapting to the needs and preferences and language of upcoming generations. But, like other laboratories, not every experiment goes well. And we need to ask the question, okay, let's abandon that experiment. It's not working. Or it produces noxious gas. Uh, or whatever. An explosion. Let's uh, try something else. Another metaphor for thinking about culture is the metaphor of a bridge. 
we need to build bridges to people in our culture or whatever group that we're reaching out to, whatever cultural group we're trying to reach, we need to build bridges to their culture, speak their language to some degree, use their cultural forms to some degree. Um, but when we build a bridge to culture, we need to ask the question, which way is the traffic flowing on that bridge? Are people crossing the bridge into full Christian mature discipleship? Or are the saints saying, hey, I like the other side of this bridge better because it's less demanding. Let's go over there. And we should be doing this in our leadership meetings, 
uh, at every level. We should be asking, okay, here's what we're doing in our ministry with the youth. What kind of results do we think it's producing? Why do we think it's producing those results? What can we do differently? A lot of people do this instinctively in ministry anyway without calling it this. But what I would like to say, I guess, is introduce spiritual maturity as one of those criteria that you think about as you do that. Not just how many kids came or how many people came to the outreach event, but looking at the overall scope of our ministries, how are people spiritually maturing and what can we do differently to encourage that? Or another way to put it is, what kind of Christian is our church, our ministry, likely to produce? And if that's not what we want, how can we make changes? The third thing I want to say about what churches can do is to build intergenerational community. It's very trendy right now to talk about intergenerational community, both inside and outside the church. But there is some good research that suggests that both young people and adults benefit from intergenerational relationships. Probably the best youth ministries have a lot of adults from the church involved in uh, forming relationships and leading small groups with the youth. Um, but we need to think hard about this and realize what it takes. It takes to truly be intergenerational, and a church takes a shift in ministry philosophy, not every church is going to be able to go there. It takes some intentionality, and most of all, it takes a mutual self-sacrificial love. It may even take a new ecclesiology, new theology of the church that demands it. Um, but one specific recommendation I would make here, or a challenge I would put down for all Christians to consider is, uh, we should strongly consider whether we should have a separate youth worship service on Sunday morning. I don't believe that we should, um, because I believe it's sending a bad message. And if, when you propose that in your church, you get squawking from both the youth and the adults, what that says is, there isn't the self-sacrificial mutual love that is needed, because to really have an intergenerational worship service, everyone, youth and adults, have to be a little uncomfortable sometimes. And so it's very telling, I think, uh, when people don't want to come together as generations, as intergenerational. So we need to ask ourselves, what are we doing to foster relationships between adults and young people? Sometimes, as I was uh, presenting in different places about my book, people would ask, okay, what should we do? And I, the number one thing I say is get adults relating to young people in the church and talking about faith matters because that will stretch the adults to grow and it will help the youth to grow. One example of, of uh, a man I admire, youth ministry professor, says that at, at the church that he... Uh, leads. Uh, once a month, they have at the youth meeting, once a month, they have the parents come. And they give a teaching, and the parents and the youth sit down around the tables of eight and discuss the teaching right there at the church. Because we, I can tell you, we've tried now for years to tell parents, once you get home, talk to your kids. That just doesn't work. It's a proven fact. It doesn't work. Uh, or it doesn't work to the extent that we need it to work. We really want intergenerational faith, faith relationships to thrive. And so, uh, so the church, in a sense, needs to play matchmaker between youth and adults in the positive spiritual sense of mentoring and faith discussions. And something I, I want to mention uh, here, uh, I wasn't sure what category this should fit under, whether it should be here or whether it should be where I talked about the church being a uh, spiritual maturity being communal. But one of the things that I've seen in the history of youth ministry is that there's a strong tendency for young people uh, and youth ministers uh, to love young people, uh, but not be so sure that they love the church. And now that's spread through all generations. Uh, we love young people, but we're not sure we love the church. Or we love Jesus, and we're not sure we love the church. So we need to be thinking about how can we help people love their brothers and sisters of all different ages, and, and realize that that is to love the church. To love your brothers and sisters of all different ages is to love the church. And uh, to realize that that's part of being a follower of Jesus. Finally, I just want to mention, uh, as a way to wrap all of this up and to think about the idea of what we're going for, is we, would, we should work toward con what I like to call congruence. That is, what we say, our formal and informal teaching, for example, do we talk about falling in love with Jesus more than we talk about taking up your cross and finding rest for your souls? Uh, that first metaphor, falling in love with Jesus, you won't really find in the Bible. Uh, and uh, taking up your cross and finding rest for your souls, you will find those on the lips of Jesus.
what we do, what we model. One of the things that's been of spiritual benefit to me about thinking and writing about maturity, spiritual maturity, is that as I face difficult situations, I have to ask myself, okay, what's the spiritually mature thing to do in this situation? That's been a good challenge to me. Um, And finally, how we lead the structures, the programs, the practices of our ministry and of our church. And looking at, in particular, the practices that we do, I've already mentioned looking at the teaching. What are we teaching about spiritual maturity in terms of our explicit teaching? But even what we do sends a message. You know, right now, this method of teaching, you know, might be called the sage on the stage. And what it says is, I'm the expert, and you need to sit and listen to me. And that might be a good message to send in some situations, but maybe we don't want to send that message in all of our new situations. Or another example, if all the adult education in our church is on an a la carte basis, pick and choose what you want to study, to me that sends a message that there's really no core body of teaching that every Christian needs that all needs to master. I mean, it might be great for adult learning theory, but it's not great for spiritual maturity, perhaps. Perhaps. We need to at least look at that question. Is there a body of teaching that everybody in our church needs to master? Or is it just kind of cafeteria? That communicates that that's what this thing is. Pick and choose what you want out of 